from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Hi, everybody. If you just arrived, welcome to the Mystery and Fiction Tent. My name is Maureen Corrigan. I am a regular reviewer for the Washington Post and the book critic for Fresh Air on NPR. Um, thank you. Thank you. The Washington Post has been a regular sponsor of the book festival since its inception 10 years ago. And I'm happy to say I think I've been here every year through all kinds of weather, including this kind of weather, for 10 years. I am so thrilled to be able to introduce to you a writer I greatly admire, Scott Spencer. I first became a fan of Scott Spencer's when I read Endless Love, which still stands as one of the most elegantly erotic novels I've ever read. So I highly recommend it to you. I also had the pleasure of reviewing for Fresh Air, A Ship Made of Paper, and both Endless Love and A Ship Made of Paper were nominated for the National Book Award. Here's an inside story about Fresh Air. Terry Gross and I sometimes tussle over authors. If she's interviewing an author, I usually don't get to review that author and vice versa. And there are certain authors we always tussle over. And she won with Scott Spencer because it's her show. So she got to interview him for um, Man in the Woods, which is his wonderful new novel. And what could I do? But I'm, I'm thrilled to say that uh, at least I get to introduce him to you today. So without further ado, Scott Spencer. Thank you so much, Maureen. So you realize that every time you review one of my books, it gets nominated for the National Book Award, and so I'm counting on you now. <laughs> Excuse me. I'm going to talk a little bit about the one thing I know something about, which is writing a novel, about writing in general. And I hope that there's time, I'm gonna make sure there is time for me to hear what, what you guys are thinking about and that maybe we can, even in this sort of spacious environment, get some kind of conversation going. I think there's microphones here. You know, there's a cliche that writing, that writing, that writing teachers uh, tell their students and I think it's a cliche that goes you know, straight to the heart of what people think about writing, and that is, write what you know. You know, I've taught in, I've taught in graduate writing programs, I've taught in undergraduate writing programs, and I've taught, I've taught new writers as different as you know, very well-heeled kids at Williams College up in Massachusetts to uh, prisoners in maximum security prisons. And they've all been told, write what you know. And it's not, it's not the, the worst advice you could have because you have to start somewhere. You have to go somewhere for your material and mining your own biography and mining your own travels and mining your own life is a, is a decent place to start. But after having written 10 novels, I realize that there's a law of writing that I believe in much more than write what you know. And that is write what you don't know. And it's what, you know, it's, it was John Gardner, the late novelist, in his book, I think it's called On Moral Fiction, described the novel and the story as a kind of moral laboratory where you test hypotheses of human behavior and figure out what would happen what is a good thing to happen? What is a good, bad outcome? How do people behave under stress? What binds us together? What pulls us apart? And that, that laboratory, I mean, it's, it's, it's a laboratory, it's different from a scientific laboratory. I mean, if you're working for General Mills, you have a job. You have to, you have to make a little piece of rice crunchy if you put milk on it, and that's your job. 
But, but what, what the, the laboratory work of, of a novel is more like pure science, when you're just going in for the investigation and you don't really have a vested interest in what the outcome is. So I do believe in what, write what you don't know. And I, I'll actually refine that a little bit and I'll say, write what disturbs you, <laughs> write what confuses you, and, and really write what scares you half to death. I, I, and I've written a lot, really a lot. It's, it's what I mainly do. And, and sometimes it's, it's all I do. I've written uh, journalism, I've written reviews, travel pieces, investigation, and each time, each time I get one of these jobs, each time I, I get one of these assignments or give myself one of these assignments, it's, it's been like going to night school for me. And it's been like, 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 like graduate school, really. I mean, I had one assignment from, from Rolling Stone to do a piece about the crooked financier Mark Rich had no idea who he was, no idea who he was, but sort of plunged in and found out, got another job to, to write about another Mark, Mark Knopfler, who, you know, the guitarist who, uh, who, whose band was uh, Dire Straits, and who happens to be, I found out, just about the, living, the greatest living guitar player around. I got a, a, another job uh, investigating these Christian filmmakers, you know, who made this, like the Left Behind series, and, and found out all, all about that. But, but, the real, but the real journey without maps, that's, that's actually a title of one of my hero's books. It's a Graham Greene book about his life as a traveler. But th that real journey without maps, the real voyages of discovery have been novels. And you know, I've written 10 of them. And, and as a writer of, of 10 novels, I often, I often get the question, does it get easier as you go along? And what I always forget to say is, if it does get easier as I go along, then that means I'm not doing a very good job. I mean, I like, actually, Joyce Carol Oates had a great answer to that question once. They asked her, you know, if with the passing of time, it does, does writing novels get easier? And she said, nothing gets easier with the passing of time, including the passing of time. <laughs> <laughs> you know, in my 10 novels, I, I, I've, I've imagined or tried to imagine my way into predicaments that might not seem very far from my so-called life because, you know, writers are like, magpies. We see something and we'll just pick it up and bring it back to our nest and, and, and see how we can use it. I mean, like I've written about fatherhood. Fatherhood's something that's always been interesting to me. I was very close to my father, so I'm a son. I know it from that perspective. And I'm a father of two kids. But writing about that really wouldn't take me very deep into the unknown. So what I did was write a book called The Rich Man's Table, trying to imagine my way into what it would be like if I were Bob Dylan's son, and he refused to recognize me. And then in, a, in, in another novel, Waking the Dead, I wanted to write about my home in Chicago, but rather than just kind of recapitulate my own experience there, I wrote it from the point of view of an on-the-make politician who's making his way through Chicago machine politics. In, 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 in Endless Love, I was sort of remembering my first real girlfriend, but then I was wondering what it would have been like if when her father said I should stop seeing her, if I burned their house down. <laughs> and as used to people, as, as used to, to reading novels as people are, because we've been reading novels as a culture for a couple hundred years more, I can't tell you how many people, even people who kind of know me, 
think that I possibly did that because you do plunge yourself into this alternate reality, this what if so much and part of doing your job is to make it seem as, as if it were something that, that really happened. You know, you know like in, 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 in Ship Made of Paper, I, I set that in, um, in this town that I call Leyden, New York, and it's a town that I've used quite a few times. And I suppose I could write a novel about my life there. It's not completely without interest about my poker game and my tennis and where I shop. And <laughs> but I thought it might be more interesting if I imagined my way into what it would be like being an African-American person living in this sort of slightly precious upstate New York town. Now, I mean, just to detour for a second, I, I want to talk about this uh, fictitious little town called Leyden, New York, because I, I, I've used it a few times, and I'm using it again in the, in the book I'm working on right now, and it's in, um, it's in very much in Man in the Woods, too. And I partly um, am writing about this town because I've been living in a town like that for 25 years. It's longer than I've lived any place else in my life, and I'm still very, very, I think of myself as a big city guy, and I can't believe that I've actually spent the majority of my life in a, in a, in a little town. So I'm very surprised you know, that, but I, I see that when you do live in a town like that, that you do have a chance of seeing a microcosmic version of the world. And unlike big cities where people understandably guard their privacy, there's not that much sense of privacy. There's not the same kind of sense of privacy in, in a small town. So you get to hear people's stories and you get to watch people's lives progress in, in, in a, like an ongoing soap opera that with, with, uh, with very easy access, excuse me, with very easy uh, access uh, to their lives. So now on to Man in the Woods, which is yet another book set in this laden. And I thought, I thought it was going to be, when I started off, a fairly tight and efficient book. But you know, you always have to think that. You have to tell yourself this in order to begin. You have to tell yourself it's going to be a little simpler than it's ever really going to be. But um, like every other book that I've written, it meant going on on many, many voyages of discovery and many, many reconnaissance missions. And there was an awful lot of writing about what I do not or did not know. Well, and here's a couple of the things that I had to find out. One of the things I had to find out in this book is what is the external and internal life of a carpenter? You know, John Updike always talked about this. It's one of the hardest things for novelists to do because we're so strapped to our desk. Yeah, I'm a little nervous, so they're, they're circling the tent. <laughs> um, anyways, John Updike always had trouble finding jobs for his characters. I mean, but I knew that, that my character was a carpenter. And so one of, the th one of the things that I needed to know, and I don't mean know just in this kind of term paper way, but I mean know in that visceral deep way that you have to get to in order to be able to write. I, I, I needed to know what does it feel like to love wood? What, what do you smell like? What does what, what your food taste like? What, what does it feel to be that person who knows wood as well as as, as a dermatologist knows skin or as a, an accountant knows, knows the, the tax code. And then I needed to know for this character, Paul Phillips, what does it feel like to be self-sufficient? Uh, what does it feel like to be able to fix things and, and to make things and to just do it for yourself, to not have to depend on society and then all the networks of help that we have and to need basically nothing 
from modern life. Nothing that modern life has to offer is really of interest to you. And then, further on in the book, I needed to know what it feels like when you're getting ready to kill yourself. And especially if you're a bookie. Oh yeah, and, and you have to live in Los Angeles too. And so this is what I found out. I'm just gonna read you a quick little section here. And this, this bookie's name is uh, Tom Butler, and he's reached the end of his rope. Using his forearm, Tom Butler pushes the dishes of dried toast and the unfinished cups of coffee and the sour wince of half grapefruit in its snug little bowl over to the far side of his kitchen table. Using a paper towel, he dries the area and places 50 sleeping pills and his notebook in front of him. He creaks back in the wooden chair and folds his arms over his chest. He's in his underwear and his Hawaiian shirt is unbuttoned. This bottle of pills, this blue spiral notebook, they are all that is left of the kingdom of his life. Even the dishes and cups have receded into the darkness. The clock ticking on the wall is invisible. The exhaust fan over the cook stove is running just in case it takes them a while to find his body. As for the rest of his house, it may as well have ceased to exist. The bed, the sofa, the TV, the Bowflex, the free weights, the safe in the wall, and the world beyond these walls, the houses, the stunned palm trees, the pale yellow sky, the peonies, the gamers, the oohs and the odds, the favorites, the long shots, the spreads, the people and the money, the money that is owed and the money they owe, a dream, a dream, a dream you can't remember. Well, thank you. The other thing that I needed to, the, probably the most important and the most difficult voyage of discovery in writing what I didn't know in this novel is, it was actually easier to imagine my way into wanting to kill yourself than it was to do this, and that is, what does it feel like to kill someone? You know, there's a lot of death in novels, but I, I wanted to go where, this sounds vain, but I wanted to go where Dostoevsky went and somehow make it new. And, and, and I wanted this character who took a life, I wanted him to feel the way I would feel. And actually, I'm the best person to, to do that because Nobody knows but me, I suppose. And I'm just going to read one more short section to give you a sense. And this is, this is the man thinking who has done the killing. Could it really be that simple? Could a human being be removed from the ranks of the living with little or no fuss and no consequences? What about his house? What about his belongings? Was there no one out there to come forward and say, hey, where's my husband? Where's my father? Where's my lover? Where's the man who worked for me? Where's the guy at the next desk? Where's my buddy I went to the track with every July or played cards with or jogged with? Where's that grumpy bastard with the good-looking brown dog? Where's my tenant? Where's my next-door neighbor? Was no one curious? Was no one making a stink? Wasn't there anyone wanting an answer? Could a man really be plucked from the body of life like a little splinter and just blow away and leave no trace of himself? But he has left a trace in Paul. And here he is carrying a black garbage bag into what he has already placed, some broken Coors bottles, an empty bleach container, three crumpled cigarette packs, and a waterlogged paperback edition of Bonjour Tristesse with his animal companion trotting a few feet in front of him. He's walking Shep the dog and cleaning the country road of the winter's debris that spring has exposed. And as he does, he hopes to remove the toxins in his bloodstream through the dialysis of good deeds. Now, 
the one last final, one final thing about the, uh, the characters in this book, and that's, I have a dog character in this book named Shep, who's taking that walk with that guy as he's cleaning up the road to assuage his conscience. And Shep is the closest thing to nonfiction in this book. And um, because Shep's my dog. <laughs> and I have a dog named Shep. And I thought, you know, I feel about my dog the way everyone feels about their dog. It's like, you know, so I wanted to put him in my book and I thought that would be, that would be at least something that I knew going in. But even, even there, even there, I, I realized I didn't know as much as I thought I did about, about my own dog. You know, th there was a piece a long time, oh, I don't know, at least 10 years ago in the Atlantic Monthly, and I guess to sell magazines, they had this really adorable looking dog on the cover, and, it basically, and the headline says, your dog doesn't love you. And, <laughs> and it's, your, your dog is seeing other people. I don't know what it's. <laughs> <laughs> and, and basically his, his thesis was that all these adorable things that dogs do from you know, panting and licking you and all their uh, loyalty is basically because you're their source of food. And I thought to myself, yeah, good. Good, good for the dog. I don't want. I, I don't want that kind of relationship where somebody is just sort of slavishly devoted uh, to me. And I sort of remembered that piece and remembered my reaction to it or against it when I was portraying Shep in 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 this novel. And then I realized that um, that Shep really cares about three things: protein, comfort, and safety. And since I am giving him plenty of all those things, I'm like, I'm like aces with, 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 with Shep. And so Shep actually at that point became a much more interesting character to me because he was no longer just, you know, he wasn't my dog anymore. He was somebody who I was having to imagine my way into the way I had to imagine my way into Tom Butler as he's going to commit suicide, the way I had to imagine myself into Paul Phillips when he kills a man with his with his uh, with his bare hands. All right, I, I, I'm going to stop just almost mid thought in case somebody has something they want to they want to ask because I see only have like six more minutes. I'd like to ask you when you uh, get an idea for a book. How does that happen? Are you having coffee or playing poker? Are you doing, and, and what happens when you decide, ah, that's the next one? That, that's a great question. Um, I, I find that there's two lucky places for me to, to, to have my ideas. And one is listening to music, live music somehow. I don't know what it is. It just puts me into a nice little state of, of mind where things occur to me. And the other time is when I'm driving. And um, one, of the reason, one of the ways I know that it's a good idea is if I don't forget it. <laughs> and I don't write it down immediately because I'm going to give myself that chance to forget it. Because if, if this is an idea I'm really going to use, it's something I'm going to live with for like three years, I, I want to make sure it's, it's, it's the real thing. So I'll let, my, I'll let my memory or lack of memory kick the tires on it if, uh, and b before I before I, I hop in. And the other thing is that, you know, people can have a lot of ideas, but not every idea sort of triggers that writing thing inside you. And so I've had a, what seems to me like a pretty good idea or a good notion or a good setup or interesting character. And I'm just going to assume in some sort of spiritual way they've gone on to somebody else because I wasn't the right person for them. Hi, I'm a big fan of Endless Love, uh, the book, the movie not so much. And uh, I'm a movie lover, so that's yeah. saying a lot. Uh, They're remaking it. <laughs> really? That's what they say. I hope you have more clout this time because you were obviously pretty young when they did it last time. Yeah, well, believe it or not, I have less clout. <laughs> <laughs> Because, because the, uh, 
the business has become all that more corporate and distant. But go ahead. Oh, I am sorry to hear that. Um, but your character, it's so much like um, Gatsby observing his love or um, in Marjorie Morningstar, the way she is observed. I, um, it resonated with me the same way. And I'm wondering if it was difficult, especially um, because you were so much earlier on in your career, to see the movie go such a different way where the inner life is so secondary. Um, that's the first part of my question. And the second part is how do you pitch a book where it's about the person who's doing the observing more than the, the love object? Uh, well, you mean pitch the book to a, to a publisher yes. or somebody? Well, I didn't put, uh, you know, if I went and pitched that book to a publisher, they would look at me and say, hey, how did you get my number? Exactly. I mean, <laughs> and, and not because not because of the book necessarily, but be, you know, there was no reason for a publisher to uh, listen to me. I mean, that book was very, very successful. I'll probably never have a book that was so, so universally acceptable and, and successful as that. But I sold it for ten thousand dollars, and I was thrilled that I got that much for it. So I didn't pitch this book. I wrote the whole thing out and then gave it to somebody and said, would you publish this? So, um, but you know, as to my feeling about the movie, it's sort of connected to my answer to the first one. I mean, I had no money. I had a kid, you know, three months old, and I was pretty happy <laughs> to get paid and uh, buy a house in the country. Um, I didn't realize that the movie was going to be some sort of like icon of bad movie making as it has become. <laughs> in, 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 and I'm not trying to say, I, you know, actually, I, I remain uh, very good friends with a screenwriter of, on that movie, this woman named Judy Rasco, who's written all kinds of wonderful movies and, and art films and, and mainstream films. And she sent me this thing that there's some sort of like reevaluation of the Franco Zeffirelli version of Endless Love. And, kind of say it's like a Douglas Sirk film or something, but I, 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 didn't, I didn't care for it. They, uh, the point of the movie was almost the opposite of, of what I was going for in the, in, in the novel, which was sort of a celebration of that sort of insane, heedless uh, teenage love. And I think the, the, the tagline on the movie poster was the love that every parent fears. <laughs> and so that, that's not going in the direction I was thinking about. Thank you. Okay, I think. Um, one more question, real oh, quick. Oh, so yeah, we have we have one more minute. That's great. How did, how did you get past the people that dissuaded you from ever becoming an author? Um, obviously, you're. Well, because they, they didn't they didn't have another suggestion for me. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know, in my family. Making money wasn't that important. My father worked in a factory. So, you know, the, the idea that, you know, I was going to starve to death or it, 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 didn't, it didn't hang over me like a sword the way it would have if my father was a, a doctor or a lawyer. And I felt that I had to maintain that sort of upper middle class uh, lifestyle. So I didn't really, I, I mean, the, all that was standing between me and becoming an author was was learning how to do it. Okay, well, thanks for coming out. It's great to see you all. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.